Thursday, April 19th, Watertown Board of Adjustment meeting. Can I get a roll call? Absolutely. Kaist? Case? <laughs> Here. <laughs> Johnson? Here. Colhane? Here. Dolly? Here. Hansen is absent. Ford? Here. Olson is absent. Oletsky? And Stein is abstained from this meeting. Thank you. All right, the first item on the agenda is the sign permit 1551. Can you walk us through that, Kenny? You bet. <coughs> uh, Stein sign, Mark Stein, sign permit number 11551 appeals to following requirements of the sign ordinance as it applies to property located at 3131st Street Southeast. Uh, off premise signs shall be limited to 288 square feet in size and shall not conflict with the state or federal law. The provision of this sub subsection shall be deemed to apply to any federally designated right of way. The applicant is applying to put a 360-foot square foot billboard, two-sided digital billboard, in replacement of an existing sign. Uh, if you guys are familiar, this computer is not working very, very well at all. So, uh, this is the Hobby Lobby parking lot. We got 212 down here. There's an existing billboard here right now that you guys have all probably seen through the past. They are, they are requesting to take and remove this sign and put a digital billboard. Uh, this sign where it sits right now is not legally sitting conforming. It's in an easement and too close to the road and everything else. But they would place a legally conforming sign approximately in this area here. Um, actually, I have that. Can you go to the overhead for me, Ray, please? No, that's good. So you can see this designates the existing sign right now that's in there. And of course, the B is the two-sided digital sign that's proposed to go on the property. This has been public notice. All public notice requirements have been met. We have not heard from anybody pro or con to the issue. So, other than Mr. Stein, has been pro here today. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing then. If anybody speak on behalf or against. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for thank you for your consideration as we talk through this request. Um, I'm Stuart Stein from Stein Sign Display, and we are adhering to we are adhering to all of the standard sign code requirements for this particular location, except for for one piece. We are adhering to the minimum lot size for C3, which is twenty thousand square feet. We are adhering to the single monopole structure, which then in turn provides a clean, modern look, which was the intent of this sign code as it was rewritten here just a couple of months back. We're seeking an exception on the square footage for the sign, so that's the piece that we are asking for the variance on that is one-third less than this existing sign. We're asking for 72 square feet. That's essentially what this request is all about. And I do have a picture that I think would actually help show that uh, request even a little bit clear. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't uh, show up if it could be zoomed in. There's so a what, yeah, what he's trying to show you is this line yes. here. That is the line that uh, Ken just circled. That is what 288 square feet would look like. You're okay? basically going to get rid of that and, exactly. and, the, and the written word on the bottom. Correct. That's what would be allowed under the sign code as it's written right now, the black box. Where's, wh where's, where's the 360 line on the box? The 360 line would essentially be right here. Okay, so this is where it would be cut off. This entire right side, the right side of my finger would be cut off. So whose head gets cut off if we go to 288? No heads get cut off. The bottom tag line gets cut off. This black box represents 288 square feet. And then the 360 would be everything. There. That would be 360 square feet, correct. So we're, we're reducing the size. Just to kind of recap the numbers, the existing board as it stands right now is 480 square feet. That would be the correct. 480 square feet is the existing board. The sign code as it as it stands right now allows 288 square feet. We're asking for 360 square feet. 
So with those numbers, we're, we're giving up 120 square feet, asking for 72 as kind of that happy medium. We felt like this would be a reasonable request um, given the consideration, uh, give, given the circumstances. And, and the, those circumstances are this. This particular billboard is 100. Go back to the thing to the, to the yeah. You can see the difference in here and in here. Correct. And from here and here. The, 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 the main concern that we have with this particular location and the whole premise for this request uh, has to do with the distance from the road. If you compare, just for comparison purposes, the billboard that we have that's by High V is 10 feet off the road from the edge of the billboard to the edge of Highway 212 is 10 feet. This location, for example, between uh, what you see here, the edge of the road and where the proposed site would have to be due to the power lines would be roughly 100 feet, so 10 times the distance. What's the square footage size on that sign by High V? 10 by 30, approximately, the 288 square okay. feet. Okay. Yep. Um, So there, there, there's two big issues with that, with this distance. The distance creates a challenge for people that are driving by to be able to read and comprehend something that's 100 feet off the road versus 10 feet off the road. There's a big difference there. The other aspect that we're dealing with is the fact that the high V board for comparison purposes is 35 miles an hour, and the one here that we're seeking a request on is a 45 mile an hour speed zone. So we've got two, two obstacles there. We participated in the sign code discussion most recently a few months back that was over the span of probably a year that probably encompassed what felt like 20 some meetings there were four four representatives from our company there was a representative uh, from another billboard company here in town mike sheehan no no one from our company no one of the four representatives from our company nor mike sheehan nor any of the people that were on the sign code committee thought of the need to address the billboard size for billboards that are so far off the road. We've never had any examples that have been an issue for us in any of the billboards that we have around the area, uh, new or existing. Apparently, uh, no one else had that same concern. So over those, again, 20 plus meetings, give or take, uh, no one from our company or anyone else on the committee ever thought that, you know, we should probably write this into the code that if it's X number of feet off of the road, an additional, say, 25% should be granted for the sign code allowance. So that, that's why this is unique, because out of all of those meetings that took place, not one time was this ever brought up. And I don't feel that based on this one circumstance and based off of our previous history of never having this issue ever become an issue, with the road and the distance, that it makes sense to have to rewrite the sign code just for this request. It just. How many signs are on the north side of the road between 19th Street and 31st Street? I mean, the, the reason I ask that question is that in this situation, this, this is one sign, but those other signs are 100 feet back from the road. So if we we're going to be looking at doing one, theoretically, we could be asking four more ass down the road. And if that's the case, then maybe the more appropriate thing to do would be to have an amendment to the ordinance if that's what we're looking at. No, there's three, there's two or three signs that, that sit on the north side of the road there, aren't there? And, and, and frankly, we, Stein Sign Display, probably own most of those boards between that point where Ken is right. referencing and this. How many s how many signs are there? Probably six. Theoretically so theoretically, we could have. 13. I counted them. Okay. Yesterday. Theoretically, we could have 13. six to thirteen ass, increasing the setback from or increasing the size sign from two eighty eight to three sixty. And if that's the where we want to go as a community, that's fine. Um, but if we do a one off here and we decide not to follow that policy moving forward, that would impact you moving forward on those signs as well. So would it be better for you to have some inclination of what you could be doing with those future signs over time um, as opposed to just trying to take this on as a one-off? It's just a question. I have a question too. Isn't there a limit of number of signs you can have per mile or something on the it's ordinance? It's a 500 foot separation distance. It's 500 foot separation yeah. in the city limits. Uh, um, we supersede the state within the city limits. So. 
so them 13 signs are like far enough apart from each other? There are some that are side by side. Correct. They're not all marching along one by one. There are several spots when there are two together. Those don't meet every requirement. Correct. And then those signs don't meet the requirement. No, those signs were there. Of course, they were there put in a long, long time ago. And, Same and really, one. as that property develops, they're supposed to go away. Correct. Is that is that a con is that condition to the approval of those plats, or is that where is that at? And is there an uh, agreement in place? I was on the board long time ago for the develop I think development I was of that on property. The board when that went through. Yep. So yeah. those signs will never be replaced. Well, I remember Mark one time, gosh, you know, like a million years ago, that they one sign blew down in a storm, and then you came and asked to be able to rebuild it. And then when something happened to it, then you would have it go away or something as it got developed in that area. Do you remember that? Uh, not exactly. M uh, Mark Stein. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, with respect to, to that, there's, again, there's uh, a number of rules and regulations with respect to if a sign is severely damaged and it's a non-conforming sign, you can't reinstall it. With respect to many of the signs on uh, that Mr. K is referring to along Highway 212 there, many of those are non-conforming signs and so that if and when they are ever taken down, which they will be as that property is developed, um, they will not be reinstalled. Mark, however, if, if, if um, there is nothing being developed there in say the next three to seven years and you wanted to plant a different sign there, there's nothing precluding you from coming in and asking for a similar ask as you're doing right now. Uh, technically, no, I guess, if they're conforming, which I don't think most of those are, but because we know that that property is going to be developed, it would make no sense to put a, you know, big expense. Windstorm in comes in this summer and knocks all 13 signs down. Are you not going to come back and ask to be replaced those 13 signs for the unforeseen future? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of ifs in there, but I, I, I don't know that. Okay, one, I one if, <laughs> God comes in, smites <laughs> it out, and they're not conforming, you still have the ability to come in and ask for a sign. If you came and asked for a sign, would you ask for 288 or would you ask for 360? We would ask for 288 because, again, with the circumstances of this electronic sign, it's a lot. Um, <coughs> it's a it's a a lot different circumstances with respect to the um, billboard signs because many of them are are way bigger than two, 288 square feet. For that matter. I'm not trying to pin you down. I'm just trying to. I'm just. These are the issues that you know, people want to know it about. The other, the other piece that I would say, too, is that if that happens, you know, there, there has to be an economic decision that takes place because it's very costly to put up a single monopole structure. Right. And the likelihood that we would ever recoup our return on investment by the time we uh, had that new monopole board in the ground, we would be rolling the, rolling the dice right. on whether or not someone would come in and develop that property, you know, next week. So uh, if that happens, it would be a long, hard discussion on whether or not it would be worth it. In my opinion, we probably would not. And, and the reason I'm asking these questions is just that um, a sign committee spent over a year, and maybe it's something we don't, you don't hit it every time, I understand, been in the, in the game long enough. But 288's been 288 for 15, 12, 13 years, right? And so if we go to 360, regardless of, you know, how we pen ourselves into it, 360 is the new 288. Cor um, correct. I mean, that's certainly worth consideration. But I guess I would even reference the sign code and all the representatives from our company. We never, correct me if I'm wrong, never argue that 288 wasn't the correct number because it met the need and the boards of all of the locations in town. Right. This particular board is 100 feet off the road. It's a little bit different. And I would even question whether those other 13 boards are really 100 feet off the road either. I, I personally don't think that they, they are. Look, but they I could be they look relatively in line. I mean, they're at least 80. The, the, the two on the right do, but the, you know, the two on the left and the third one on the left there, those look closer. But Ken, would you, Ken, would you measure the one on the, on the west end? Maybe. I think this is a case of the road going to the sign. 
Shane, maybe you could ask a couple engineering questions. Um, the frontage road that uh, is not planned to be an extended towards um, Hobby Lobby, is it? No, it's not. And is there any long-range plans with Department of Transportation to um, make Highway 212 divided the further west it goes towards town? There's been no active discussions regarding that that I'm aware of. The edge of that one to the center line of the road is about 120 feet. Okay, but, but again, that's a stationary sign, too. Right. We've got a long time to see one, one and the only one. Right. Uh, point of clarification as well, the 100 feet reference is from the edge, the north edge of the road, so tack on another 20 feet or 30 feet, wherever that is for comparison purposes. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in height? Are they both going to be the same as the, uh, the height's going to be the same as like the one at High V, I guess, that we're all familiar with? Correct. That would be another area that we are conforming to the sign code. 30 feet is the maximum height. It would not exceed that. Is the existing sign taller than 30 feet? The existing sign is very close to 30 feet, give or take a couple feet. I didn't take part at all in the former discussion of the formation of the sign code or sort of the latest revision, but what was the impetus for the 288? I mean, what was what's the history behind that number? Well, kind of like Todd said, it's kind of always been that way. Well, we sat down and I remember talking about it, and it's, it's a 12 by 24 sign. This is, is what 288 equals, that, and and that's I think it's been it, in there for 15 and, years ever since I've been here. And part of the reasoning was that I think at the time was people were thinking, well, if we were going to allow for stack signs, 12, and that was part of the discussion. The other aspect was. Um, you know, most of the standard signs were 10 by 30s or 12 by 30s at the time, and the the mission of that board was trying to reduce the size of signs and clutter, and so that's why I think Correct. they settled on the 288. If I remember, Mark was in some of those meetings, I think. And tw 12 by 30 being 360. 360, and a 12 by 24 is a 288. Not that this plays really any strong matter in the in this situation or the request, but in visiting with Ken, he had just shared that the city of Yankton just settled on a, a new sign code and they allow 400 square feet for their particular billboards. But, you know, Mr. Case, you, you hit it right on the head that we believe all along that as participants in the sign code discussion, whether it was the first go around or the, the previous go around, that the intent behind the sign code was to clean up the visual clutter, it was to make it neat, it was to make it look more attractive as you enter Watertown. And with a sign that has, um, again, five poles on it with a really um, ugly looking backside to it, viewable from the Hobby Lobby parking lot, you know, we, we believe that we can do better. We, we believe that if given the opportunity to put up a structure that looks similar to the one that we have by High, high, um, high V, that it would provide a single pole, get rid of four poles, that it would uh, be a more modern look, it would be more attractive and welcoming into the community, and ultimately it would be a net gain to the city because it would just look that much more attractive as an entrance. Again, reducing the size of what's already there, if that was the goal of the sign code, rather than leaving a, rather than leaving a billboard that's 480 square feet, let's reduce that by one third down to 360 square feet. So we believe that at a 12 by 30, if granted this request, we believe that at a 12 by 30, with 100 feet off the road, driving at 45 miles an hour, the sign will be readable for travelers, for tourists coming off of I-29 down our main thoroughfare into Watertown. We also believe that our intent would be to follow through with what we're doing uh, at our high V location, and that's to uh, participate in, in several thousand dollars of donations to other um, organizations within Watertown permitting, pr uh, promoting city events, uh, nonprofit organizations, and we would continue that uh, with, this, with this board. So in addition, that 72 square feet that we're asking for would give businesses additional to just the one that's there now, additional businesses, the opportunity to promote themselves, the products and services that they offer, and give, um, give everybody the confidence to know that when the board is there, people are gonna be able to read it, understand it, comprehend it, and it, it's a net gain and a net win for the city, in my opinion. So 
we appreciate your opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring this before the board and would open it up to any other questions that you may have. I have two. Um, and one's for you. And uh, Shane, do you, uh, I'll start with Shane. Has there been any discussion uh, or what at level would you anticipate Highway 212 reducing its speed from 45 to 35? What would have to happen out there? We've had a few um, discussions with the DOT. Um, it's their intent to maintain the speed and efficiency of the highway as they have the vision to keep that speed up uh, to its current level and location. They don't want to alter it. Ultimately, I think as the city grows east, you know, eventually we'll have to consider a speed limit change. And then, uh, Stuart, regarding the 20,000 square foot piece of property that you are placing this sign on that's in your uh, possession, do you anticipate um, developing that 20,000 square foot for uh, a subsequent commercial use? The answer is no at this point. I mean, the, the purchase of the property was strictly for the billboard, but if I had my wish, we'd put a cold stone creamery there. <laughs> <laughs> and then how does that work, Kenny, with total signage on lot with off and on-premise signs? Is that Would that impact a, a, a building there? Yeah, any signage they put up there, if they do a future building, would go against their signage allotment. So th that would go. So theoretically, depending on how much signage they would have, they would lose the 360 off the top. Yep. So if they were given a total of 1,000, they'd lose 360 whatever square feet off of that for the rest of their structure. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> I have a question. You um, talked about the speed limit and the visibility and the readability of the sign, and you, you um, back that up with, I believe, I believe, I believe. Are there any industry standards or engineering studies or any specifications that relate to readability of a sign, distance from a roadway, speed limit? There must be some industry standards or engineering studies out there that give you a guideline on that. Yeah. Is there more than I believe it won't be readable? Is there some documentation, data to back that up? That's, that's a very fair question. And I'd like to call in the expert on that one, and I'm going to call in uh, Chris, Chris Wilson because uh, – Chris uh, deals with this type of thing more frequently than I do. Oh, all right. Chris Wilson, Stein Sign Display. Um, I believe if I understand your question right, you're asking if there's some kind of a documentation or some some um, w you know letter of the law standards that we are supposed to follow or, or should Not follow. Not necessarily letter of the law, okay. but has there been some studies when you go out to a customer? and they want to put up a sign someplace, and it happens to be 100 feet off this highway, mm -hmm. and the speed limit is 45 miles an hour, there must be a way that you can put pen to paper and use an algebraic equation of some sort and say, this is the minimum sign that is going to allow this sign to be readable under these conditions, rather than just saying, I believe it's what you need. Correct. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a very uh, fair assumption. The way we would attack that, uh, there's, uh, there's not really a set of guidelines. It's all about visual. So when we're talking about an electronic sign, we're talking about something that has content that's different from one advertisement to the next. So we would, we would suggest, okay, uh, if you're going to have a verbiage on there, your letter height would need to be no less than X to be able to be clearly read. Um, but because there's so much more involved in those advertisements, there's pictures, there's logos, things like that, it's, there's really no hard, fast rule. It's uh, you want six inch tall letters, but we're sorry, you're not going to be able to read that. So we're, we would have to make them be 12 inches. You know, it's, I don't have the formula, I don't have the equation. We just know, uh, we just know. <laughs> There, there are actually, if you, I mean, even if you were to Google it, there are certain charts that they have that say in order to be read uh, at 45 miles an hour, the minimum height has to be X inches. So to, to, your, to your question, there, there is a chart. There is some sort of a guideline and table um, because ultimately, I mean, at this location, yeah, you could have six-inch letters, but it's not going to be readable. So another way to put it is 
say, you know, 12 inches in letter height at our high V board at 35 miles an hour at 10 feet off the road is not going to be the same in terms of readability at 12 inches, 100 feet away at 45 miles an hour. So it limits the, it, it limits the amount that you're able to essentially work with on the board, limits the uh, content, if you will, on, on how effective that message can be because there's, again, there's only so much time you can read as you're driving by and there's only so much space on the board to work with. So there are some parameters in place out there. I don't find that terribly scientific. <laughs> I can try to do a quick Google search if you. No, would. that's fine. That's fine. There, there are there are tables out there that say that they have to be. And how does the to how do the how do those tables apply to this particular? Did you apply those to this request? Since there are tables out there. Well. I guess my concern is I'm just trying to find a way to support you. However, I feel a sense of obligation to not erode the integrity of the sign ordinance that was worked on um, over such a long time by so many people who, you know, uh, cried yeah. over it. Right, and yeah. I. I'm struggling with not eroding the integrity of the assigned ordinance. Right. Uh, and again, we appreciate that. Again, like everybody, we're citizens of Watertown. We don't right. want junky sounds out there any right. more than anybody else does, which was why we think this is a, a net gain for the city of Watertown by re removing that big ugly sign there and putting up a cool looking modern sign. I will say this though, that with respect to um, the sign height, the sign letters, whatever. Uh, again, I'm gonna let you in on a secret of the sign business. We don't lose that chart even when we're making signs in front of businesses. It's it's what looks good, what looks appealing, what's readable. And for the eye test, the eyeball test, what we did do was go to the hy V location and sat 100 feet away, which put us in the parking lot of Villhauer Rammel, you know, and, and it was not legible, it really wasn't, with the size of the sign that was there. So scientific, you know, perhaps not, but valid nevertheless, as far as why, how we arrived at our request of a 25% uh, yeah, increase. And that's what I'm interested in. So that's right. a really interesting point that you actually did, went out and did that experiment, and that certainly provides some support for your choice in the square footage. Here. That's what I was looking for something to support that random, which appeared to be a random number. <laughs> and, that, and we weren't moving at the time. That was, that All right. was it wasn't so even at 45 moving. miles an hour? All right. Th this, is, this is 100 feet from the edge of the billboard and across from Hy-Vee, just as a comparison purpose. S stationary. So hopefully that at least provides some, a real life example. I, I use my golf range finder pretty scientific there. So it's <laughs> literally down to, down to the yard. So tell me Stuart, what happens if it's denied? What what's your plan? It's one of the questions that we have to answer. Uh, as I alluded to earlier with Mr. Kays, we'd have to make that decision. The, ec the economics of it all come into play. So option number 1 would be to leave it as is with the single advertiser collect revenue and support that that's one of the options the other option I mean, you're not taking it down it's going to stay there no it's going to stay there perpetual because you own the land that it sits on so there will always be a billboard there that's one of our options okay one of our, one of so our it's going to be there yeah, yeah. okay yep. that's i'm just making that point for you you know absolutely so there's always going to be a sign there no matter what it looks like so we can either stick with this or we can like you said modernize and move forward exactly I think it's clear that the, the proposal that you've brought is an improvement over the existing structure. It's the material and construction is mm -hmm. more in compliance with the standard. Um, I, I understand the, the request for the size difference based on the, the setback from the road. And, you know, I'm just thinking about it in terms of, you know, almost like when you go to the eye doctor and you're looking at the, the letters, right? They don't change in size, but if you got farther back from that, it gets harder to read. Um, so I understand the request. Uh, along Todd's line of conversation earlier though I think you know I would I would probably prefer to see something in ordinance 
that would say if it's you know past a certain distance from the road that we would change the the size requirement or size allow allowable I think there is an opportunity I mean if we are collectively thinking that an ordinance change is necessary we could pigeonhole this variance by conditions um, so that no one else can make the same ask giving us time to look at changing the ordinance if that's where this board is is at um, I, I I do agree. I think the distance from the edge of the road many billboards if you go out to the highway um, they, they sit right on the property line and depending on this is a, a, an extra large right of way that we don't see through many areas within the community so you could make a justification for that I'm, I'm generally averse to, to variances and the only way that I would support a variance in this section would be to make it specific to only electric signs only uh, no bigger than 360 feet no uh, uh, at least 100 feet from the edge of the road um, and then if that was to move forward instruct staff to come back with an ordinance to support what we're doing here mm -hmm. The proper way, more or less, would be to deny, let us fix it, and have them come back in six weeks. I don't know what that does to your timetable. Well, like anything, of course, time is of the essence. And, and dollars. Of we'd, it's we'd, money. We'd, we'd appreciate the consideration. And, and um, <clears throat> I, I, I guess I would just reference that, again, for as many representatives that were from the billboard industry as part of these sign code discussions, and the sign code committee in itself, this issue never came up. And so uh, the need to rewrite the sign code can certainly be done, but I think it could still be accomplished with Mr. Kay's suggestion and idea as well. And with your caveats, it definitely protect anybody else coming in that th this was the ground that we had to meet to do it. So, My biggest fear is in other locations in and around town, then we now have exploded into a 360. You know that that's sort of the new standard, and I don't. That, that would be my fear. Mm -hmm. where, where I do, I mean, I don't. I don't inherently have any issue with the 360. As we talked about, there didn't seem to be any real reason why it was at 280, besides sort of limiting it back a little bit. In this particular instance, it seems like it makes sense at 360. My fear is that then somebody else utilizes this instance and then tries to. And the other thing is, 360 looks small here. But 360 in a area where we have development in, then it looks cluttered, and I think that was the reason backing off from 360 to 288 many years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think if if one of those ordinances, one of those stipulations, is that this sign of this magnitude has to sit on a lot, whatever their lot size is. We we've already changed the ordinance to do that. We, they're no longer able to put any. Okay, so billboard on a sign that's not a legally conforming I, I don't 20, think we're going to have too many people running out buying that chunk of land along here that to put a sign up. Where yeah. Prime development property. That exactly. That, I don't help, think that, that helps that a lot, Kenny. Right. So I think that that would eliminate that um, like you said uh, copycat idea here. You know, and I, I'm I with you. I don't I don't want to see a bunch of, you know, moving signs up there unless my pictures on it, but <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think anybody's really proposing to rewrite this the sign ordinance. I mean that would basically be an addendum to the, the existing ordinance if we if right. we wanted to pursue that. So John Stonebarger. Uh, I'm not normally known as a sign guy. I'm not normally known as being friendly to sign people, but uh, in this instance looking at the existing sign what's there right now is really not very attractive. Uh, it's 166 more, 166 percent larger than what you allow and uh, it's down to five poles and the back of it is really terrible. Uh, they are willing to modernize the sign, make it look a lot nicer and like they were saying when we were in the sign code uh, meetings we never anticipated a sign that would be off the right of way and so the su uh, subject of do you need to have a large assignment farther back you probably do but we never addressed it because we never thought it was going to happen mm -hmm. the ones uh, farther west they're going to sunset when they start 
building buildings there. This one probably will stay there. So there's no building that's going to be going in there and they're not going to be taken away. Uh, if you don't do anything, they can leave this existing sign there and it'll probably be there and just as ugly as it always is. But, uh, <laughs> I, I support, you know, allowing them to do that because you're going to have a electronic sign on a monopole, which is a lot nicer than what you have here. And also the back will be an additional sign because <coughs> right now the back of this is really not attractive. So with that, that's my two cents worth. I just want to say you guys do a really good job. And I know you're taking your volunteer time to get slings and arrows on it. It's, it's so nice fun. to see you again. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks John. <laughs> and this will probably be the last time you see me before the war. So take care. Was there anybody else to speak? Mark Meyer, Utilities. I just wanted to Mark Meyer, Utilities. I just want to state we've been working with the Steins, but there is an electric overhead line going on across their kitty corner, and it's required by electric code that the sign has to be a minimum of 10 foot away from the conductor. So we've been working with them, but I just wanted to state that the placement of the sign Meet your requirements. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. If there's no additional comment, I'll close the public hearing. I'd like to make a motion. Motion by Mr. Case. Motion to e approve the variance to locate the sign uh, as uh, applied for um, based upon the following findings. One, the location of the sign is at least 100 feet from the northern edge of um, Highway 212. And, and further, the uh, Board of Adjustment um, would only entertain a similar request for an electric message center monopole sign design located at least 100 feet from the edge of a public road to allow for a sign of the size of 360 feet, square feet. 360, right? Do do we want to uh, request to look at the ordinance? Do that as after, after, yeah, okay. after that. Do we want to add anything about the speed being a factor as well, finding a back on the speed? Um, I'll take that as a friendly amendment. That speed has to be at least 45. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Call Hain. All in favor, say uh, aye. Discussion, uh, discussion, discussion, discussion. Sorry. <laughs> so how does putting the speed of 45 in apply if the speed goes down and the sign is there? It will not affect the sign if the speed goes down to 35. The 45, the 45 would be for subsequent. Future. Subsequent requests. I'm hoping that if, if this, regardless of how this goes, we have a more formalized discussion establishing what the standards should be but if we are doing it to accommodate this applicant I we're pigeonholing for future requests okay, thank you. any additional discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed motion passes Now, uh, again, just as a, for the, well, we can do this under planning commission. Under uh, new business? Under new business. Under Is there any old business for the Board of Adjustment? Oh, no. <laughs> no old business? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Colhane, second by Johnson. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm rusty here. <laughs> nice to see you.
All right, thank you. I'd like to call to order the Thursday, April 19th City Planning Commission meeting. Can I get a roll call, please? Case. Here. Dargis Johnson. Here. Colhane. Here. Dolly. Here. Stein. Here. And Olson and Hansen are absent. Do we have a quorum? So the first item on the agenda is a new item, invitation for public comment participants submittal. What action do we need to take here? That, that's just an agenda item, and um, Todd, if you want to explain I can it, explain it. There's um, a new law that was passed this year by the state legislature. It says that any public board or appointed board um, has to allow the opportunity for individuals to address that board whenever there's a public meeting. While that law doesn't go into effect until the 1st of July, um, the city is taking it upon itself to start incorporating that into their normal board meetings. Uh, we can set up how we approach that moving forward, whether we allow them to come in at the front end or if we make them you know, s do it at the back end. You know, that's something we can talk about as we start talking about how we run our meetings in the future. But nor normally what th this would be is that if somebody wanted to address the board, we can allow them to address the board for something that's generally not already on the agenda okay. and give them a, a specific amount of time to talk. So if they had comments on a specific agenda item, they'd wait, wait until the public mm -hmm. discussion. But if, say, say, I want to come in and tell you how I like spring, and that's all I want to tell you, <laughs> um, you give me two minutes, and we can talk about spring. Uh, spring went door wide open. <laughs> but so then how we set it up is we put the invitation for pu public comment participants, so then they would come up and submit that they would like to be at the end of the agenda, and then that's where we have the like number nine, that's where it's open public comments, so then that's where they can come back and then um, speak on their matter. So then if they are here for something that's on the agenda, then they'll speak at that time. And then also then we would ask again at number nine, just in case somebody showed up late, did anybody else want to okay. address the board? So to, to start it off, we make an invitation. They can come up to the, uh, to the table here, sign up, introduce themselves, ask them what they want to talk about, and then you put them on the agenda. Yeah. Do we have up, up to the podium. Do we have anybody in the audience that would like to speak today? <laughs> Chip jumped up right away. <laughs> so, so seeing none today, I think we can move on to the second item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. So the third item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the April 5th, 2018 meeting. So moved. Motion by Colhane. To approve. Second by Johnson. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. The fourth item on the agenda is the discussion of adding licensed residential treatment or group homes as conditional uses in the C1 district. Yes, so we have been approached by a couple different groups about how to address um, group home situations. Um, and right now in ordinance, and let, all right, I should have had it pulled up. I'll read our definition. Um, but then where it's allowed as far as zoning districts is in the R2 or the R3 residential zoning district. And we wanted to also include it in the C1, which would be a downtown commercial setting. So um, if it would be a, a group of um, people like recovering, if they with alcohol or drugs, um, where it would be adults living together, and then they would be, um, they'd have access to the amenities that uh, downtown offers, um, where we think it'd be a good fit to add that as a conditional use to the C1 community commercial district. Do we have areas of the city that are zone C1 which are not in what I would call the urban area of the community? Uh, I don't think so. Yes, every, every, yes we do, don't we? Well, then why did you ask the question? Well, I just want to make sure that's out there. Um, I think the C1 downtown is fine. I think C1 and other areas of the community, maybe we'd want to just, if we ratchet it down to group homes in the C1, and we were talking about having it so they're close to facilities, um, that would be my recommendation if, if we want to do that. Have, have we had any requests that have triggered this uh, conversation? 
there was a group that was looking at a home downtown um, where it wouldn't it wasn't allowed even by conditional use so it's 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 something that's necessary for our community um, we have individuals that are for whatever purpose may need to have a, a group setting um, and sometimes it might be easier to locate them in a commercial area than in a residential zone um, so I, I think I, I would be supportive of, of doing something we we don't have a lot of specific um, design standards or, or regulations that are associated with group homes but putting them as a conditional use would allow us to, to develop those as we go along. Sarah Karen Mayor, I sat on in on a committee discussion about this with the county. Um, <coughs> Judge Carmen Means, the sheriff, um, Bruce Bueller from the city council, several different social service agencies and lawyers were present at the meeting to talk about um, having group homes in the downtown specifically so that people could walk from the group home to anything. They could walk to the police department, they could walk to the grocery store, they could, um, they, they wouldn't need to rely on public transportation or, um, you know, whatever, they, they could get by on their feet. And so specifically the downtown was requested and that's zone C1. The other C1 areas are remote and they probably wouldn't be interested out by the ice arena there wouldn't be um, a reason to put it out there or you know where the other ones are so um, that was the thinking of why c1 just want to add that Um, I guess some other questions that we had as a group um, that we want to discuss with the board would be, um, you know, how many how many people parking um, and like proximity to schools or churches, if that would be a concern. Presently, we have no design standards or for performance standards for group homes on the R2 or the R3 as well. So are you thinking about this would be something that would apply to all the, all group homes regardless throughout the community? I, yes, I would think you'd have a group home standard to meet with conditions and only approved as a conditional use. And this would, this would apply for either group homes with or without staff or service or um. well and, and you might wa want to make a distinction in in that regard I haven't thought through to that extent of it um, I think if you're just hearing this for the first time now it's you know it might take you a while to think about what kinds of conditions <coughs> should you put on this type of use should it be a certain distance from certain other uses um, or zoning districts, that sort of thing. And does it require setbacks or any, any kind of standard that you would want that might be different from the zone? Well, in, in this case, the C1 has no setbacks from the rights of way, so you might want to make a condition that, you know, if it's in, I don't know, just throwing that out there as something that would be in addition to the normal standards for the district if you did this type of use. I think it's a good um, idea to have the conditional use listed, but you want to be careful. You don't want to just fill it up mm -hmm. with a bunch of things with no conditions, and you want to know in advance before you do it what kinds of conditions would be required so that you're uniform in applying the standard across um, all different requests. Mm -hmm. Have we as staff looked at what other communities in the area are doing in regards to group home requirements and conditions at this point? 
and there's different types of group homes. I mean, there's are there are group homes for individuals in a, a group setting that maybe like a human service agency home. Right. Uh, there's group homes that are for individuals um, going through um, alcohol or, or drug drug treatment. Uh, group homes for transition homes for people leaving um, penitentiaries or, or, or jail settings. Um, so I think it's group home. It, it might be whittling it down to what kind of group homes. Some some group homes you can um, uh, you know, put regulations on, some you can't. I mean, if you are a protected class of, a, of an individual under the Fair Housing Act, you have to allow opportunities for those types of housings. Um, sex offenders are not one of those, um, but you know that's also another another thing that you'd want to look at too if you look at group homes for treatment for sex offenders or um, um, but I, I, it's, it's a good thing I, it's a good conversation to have so yeah we've just discussed it between um, staff and we can do research and look into other communities and then um, more so if there's anything that you guys have that you would like us to include otherwise the discussion what we've talked about we can We'll just look into that and um, bring something forward as an amendment, or would you guys want? Maybe just give us something to react to and at the next time, and then we can have a discussion, and then from that you can then formulate what the actual ordinance, but examples is good. Does anybody have any misgivings about putting that type of use in the C1? Any problem with it? Not at all. No, I don't. And frankly, I, I like the I like the idea of more uses, and sort of I don't know necessarily endorsing, but promoting more uses, particularly in the downtown area, but everywhere. I mean, throughout the city, mixed use, um, and and the idea of sort of a pedestrian focused use, which I think alleviates the need for a parking requirement. I will say that was the only only input I had is that we probably don't need to tack a parking requirement on it or a very minimal parking requirement on it because it we're talking about specifically for pedestrian use. Yeah, and many times these group homes, I mean, if they are permanent residents, lots of times they maybe aren't drivers. Um, and if they're people that are going through a transition in their life, they probably aren't as mobile going to and from places. And that's exactly right. And that's, that's why the C1 district or the downtown was um, desired for this use. And the last time this came up, think the applicant gave up <laughs> looking for a place it, it's allowed in the R3 uh, but it the Board of Adjustment at the public hearing I think there were several public hearings weren't there and it was um, without a standard <laughs> a list of, of performance standards it is kind of random and people would come up and say please not in my neighborhood Go somewhere else. We think it's great that you have this, just not here. So if you could come up with a list of conditions that would have to be met um, and say, look, they're, they're doing this, they're doing that, and all of the things that would safeguard the public um, just to make it an acceptable use, that will go a long way, I think. Any other Any comments other? from the board? That's why I was going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'll look forward to, to seeing some more from, from this proposal. Sounds good. good. We will get to that. Um, okay. Go ahead. Real quick. So on to number five, discussion of home occupations. And Jill, you'll come up and discuss that or or from there, whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is just a, I guess I'll, I'll start out. Um, this is just a, a very first and very basic draft for, for you. I'm expecting to hear, uh, we're expecting to hear a lot of input and possible changes so this is this is just the first step very very lenient you might say and it's um, more straightforward black and white okay 
and so it's it's up to this board to um, let us know what you feel about it. We're talking specifically about the checklist, right? Correct. Well, conceptually, we were talking about right now, if I need to get a home occupation, is a conditional use in residential zones or is it a permitted use? Let's start with that conversation. It is a conditional use. All right. That was what I thought, and I'm partially to blame. Um, most places where I work and most communities in the state of South Dakota treat home occupations as an accessory use. And that accessory use is generally permitted under certain circumstances. Um, in what's happening today and what we see more and more is that you have more people working at home, conducting business at home, and based on the size of the, if we were a small town and we only had three or four of these things happening at, w at one time, um, you could probably have time to do all the work. It seems to me that um, as a person sitting on a, a board of adjustment where somebody says I'm, I'm wanting to come in and do an occupation that has a minimal impact on the neighborhood in which I live, um, I'm not sh sure if I'm the person to say why, why can't you just go rent a building downtown and, and put up a shingle there. And so what I was thinking is that we would take a take a the lead from communities like Brookings and Sioux Falls and Huron and Aberdeen that um, allow you can break it up into minor versus major home occupations those home occupations that um, generate a little bit more foot traffic pedestrian traffic than others um, uh, for example in in um, Brookings they have a list of about a dozen different types of home occupations that uh, I'm an artist, I'm an artist, and I'm a, uh, I do handicrafts, I do specialty baking, we just had that a little while ago. I'm a professional office, I'm an author, word processing, computer, drafting, graphics, engineering, investment, insurance, interior real estate. I teach music lessons, um, I do mail order work or internet work, I do, do things with coin collections, I'm a sales consultant for Amway, Shackley, what have you. There's a whole list of those types of uses that probably have a very minimalistic impact on the neighborhood and depending on um, what we want to add to that list or take away from those are things I think if I came in I meet the checklist that staff has put together which I think is is a good thing let the staff just issue a permit for that if there's something where there's some neighborhood concern or they want to use uh, maybe there's a more intensive occupation that way we come up with a list of those those then come come to the board as a board of adjustment action item. I mean, I just a firm believer that we don't need to be creating work for creating works for works, you know, just to do that. Because the, the situation today is any home occupation would have to come come conditionally. We come see them, you know. If somebody's watching four kids in their house, probably maybe not. Somebody's watching 12 kids in their house, maybe yes. Um, somebody wants to cut hair in their home, and it's the same, you know, maybe, maybe if I'm going to only cut hair on weekends, maybe not. I mean, th there's different types of situations mm -hmm. that, uh, is it really, is, is it problematic or, you know, and that, that would be a, a, as a, if the staff issues the permit and we receive complaints, well, then that would be an opportunity then for it to come back to the Board of Adjustment because mm -hmm. maybe there's a concentration of home occupations in the neighborhood. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but. Uh, that's kind of where I was at with the whole discussion, and and I know staff's been doing some work on that. We landed, and we're well. Jill put it all together. Where we have the checklist, where then like here, where it explains that um, if compliance with all limited home occupation standards cannot be met, application for conditional use permit must be submitted. So as long as everything on the checklist, and that's where it'll be. You guys should study that to see if there's anything that you see as a concern where if there's something that they're always going to have to come to the Board of Adjustment and they're, or that we can change on here um, and I guess what we can do or how we can improve or change the checklist. I like, I like what you did on the one. I got confused as there's a couple different checklists, but the one checklist where you have a listing of types of businesses 
I would like you to revisit that, look at some other different communities that have listings that are much more comprehensive. I'd rather start comprehensive and whittle it down as opposed to start small and build it back up. Yeah. I, if, um, if I can interject there, um, what we started with here is, is basically, oh, yeah. there's the one checklist, the second checklist that you're referring to that has the blue um, writing is simply notes saying why we why we did that right okay so um, these things like I said this is very black and white very mm. basic to start out with and we started out with some place that would have it, it includes a lot of a lot of businesses but they would be very basic we looked for um, basically I'm going to say zero um, uh, people coming in, clients coming in, it would be just be somebody working out of their home. Um, so you wouldn't have any I wanted expanded more than that. Part, but it wouldn't have any parking issues. This is where we started. Yeah. And um, basically it would have, anybody living beside them would not even know there was a business existing there. No signage, that would include vehicles with signage that would you know be parked outside, it would be parked inside. They would have a limited 25% area. I'm there. fine with that. I, I, I've read that. But I'm, what I'm saying to you is I wanted to start much bigger and whittle it down. Mm -hmm. That's my, I mean, unless, un, uh, unless you guys want to start with that and going up. I think, again, if we can be more um, out there so that, again, we're not generating work for work's sake that really has no negative I impact on a neighborhood, I don't know why we need to be over-regulatory in that perspective. You're so talking on the example businesses that are. Listed. Yeah, I think b be large, and then and then and and, and if people, um, if it's a small daycare, if it's somebody teaching daycare. music lessons, yeah. they could come in and out. Daycare isn't included in this. I want it. I want you to. I want you to start big, and we Let's will have the conversation later. Yeah. I want a litany of uses that we can go through, and take them on one at a time, and then if we want to say that's a major or a, or a minor home occupation, yeah. we can go from there. So I'd rather start big. Whittle it back. Mm -hmm. Just just for a point, though, daycare is going to be its own animal um, aside from this one. I would recommend daycare be a home occupation, like teaching music is a home occupation, mm -hmm. doing taxes is a home occupation. Daycare of certain sizes trips it into a, a higher review. Certain businesses that if I'm, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's me. I want home occupations as a whole. And this is me. And if the rest of the board says, Todd, you're all wet, great. But if we're going to make this a permitted accessory use, permitted means permitted, not a conditional use. And let's come up with those uses that we're fine, that we don't have to see. And, and I think the list that is put together here, I mean, it, does, it says that there are very low impact home occupations such as, but not limited to. So, and, and I, I think that yeah. we had the direction or that we were under the impression that the direction we were going with daycares was going to be separate, which is why we didn't include it with this, it, that it would be regulated um, on a different level or our Well, if, if we come back with daycare regulations, and if we're talking about daycare, and we're going to say some daycares are going to be a conditional use and some are permitted uses, then your animals already fit for certain size daycares. It's always okay. easier to whittle down than it is to build up. I mean, we'd rather be comprehensive than any approach when you're talking policy. That's just my, my, my background. What's your thought on the, the checklist? I like the checklist. It's really good. I, I, I like everything that they've done. All I'm just saying is it's just I don't want us to pigeonhole ourselves into saying it's only if this, this, and this happens. I think there are some things that we can be looking at. Um, there's, there are a ton of examples out there. I, I spent 20 <laughs> minutes today and went through six towns in the city in the state of South Dakota that have a litany of types of uses that those communities don't have a, seem to have a problem with. And, and, there are, and most of those communities are bigger than the city of Watertown. So they're gonna, and that, so part of me is just thinking, if it's not impacting those communities and it's not, you know, we're not hearing horror stories, why would it be impacting us and why are we creating regulations for what is really becoming more and more prominent in our culture today as far as where people work and where they live. So I have a question. It, um, I come and fill out the, the form mm -hmm. and I am fine. You know, I have a small business, whatever. D do my neighbors still get the certified letter notifying them that no. I am? No. So no one is notified around me? 
No, but if there are complaints, that would be part of the issuance of the administrative permit. If there are complaints or something comes up, and a neighbor could, that would be part of the ordinance that they could then ask that they feel that they're agreed by the decision of a board or a member, it comes back to a board, we could have it then. What if by this checklist we would add that where we still would send certified mailings and if anybody came back negative, then the check was no? Maybe rather than adding expense and time and, and work activities, I mean, if you guys want to add more work, go for it. I'm trying to help you yeah. here by from a staff level that you don't need to have that much work. If you want to make a requirement in there that they need to have a uh, at least contact their neighbors or a sign off, that may be the, put the onus on the applicant and not on staff. Right. Well, I mean, and but I think it is important that we still do protect the residential neighborhoods because if it's something that a neighbor does have concerns about, just that they're notified. I think know. I think just like you said, have the have that home, homeowner running around getting yeah. the six signatures I mean, or what have you. I, mean, I think yeah. they should be notified. And and that's and that's that's part of what I'm saying from a discussion standpoint. But I think. Um, I'd rather have the discussion about large op large ideas as opposed to small ideas. And I think at least with the, the checklist, the way that it's defined here, that's describing a business that, you know, your neighbor probably wouldn't even know that you're operating right. today. And that's going to be... And, and most people probably are operating it today unknown to their neighbors. Yeah, and and that's going to be yeah. less than 5 or 10% of the actual businesses that you're probably talking about yeah. that people come in, you know. So, Mid, several of our businesses would actually meet this. Um, we're, we're talking about instead of defining the business exactly like a tax business or an insurance business, we basically defined it by um, the level of business. Like you know, you. you I could think have, I, I I understand. Yeah. I can read that part. But what I think and is is I think it's uh, too restrictive. Is what uh, is my opinion. I think you need to open it up a little bit Kay. and take 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 examples from other places that do have you know, a little bit more flexibility. At, in, like you say, in this case, in what you're saying here is that if I'm sitting in my room working on a computer and no one sees me for the three or four days, that's a business, that's okay. I think there are other businesses that are probably just as okay. So if we could, if we could do that, take, you know, take a larger list of example businesses and then as a group discuss which ones we're okay with, that could then affect the end checklist right right and then and then then we don't maybe necessarily have to list the, the uses themselves but what is common out where's the commonality of those uses yep. and then that becomes the standard so we don't have to have 475 okay businesses but if we have three general types of categories of businesses that we're okay with we can we can define that so do you want us to just research other towns and come back with a list of business types and start there coming back to you with that or I think if you take a look, go to Brookings, go to Sioux Falls, go to Aberdeen, go to Rapid City, and take a look at what they've done. Mm -hmm. Some of them, so each one of them has good parts. Generally, there's some sort of a uh, listing of types of businesses, business specific, but you can you can you can marry what they're trying to do there, and it's um, not as restrictive as what's being proposed here. That's where I'm at. I mean, uh, and, uh, unless the rest of the board is fine with with what we got here, we could vote on it. Today I'm fine, but I, I'm I would like to see a little bit more flexibility put into the process. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely fine with this because it's, it's pretty restrictive. But I wouldn't be opposed to making it a little bit less restrictive and allowing right. more in administratively either. Right. So if we do look at those example businesses and can come to terms of which ones are okay. To to keep it broad though too. I mean, even no matter what your business is or you know, if. If we would just include whatever we want in the checklist, then if it just it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's meeting all of the check. Right. Where yeah. so then why couldn't we say um, limited home occupations are and just not have a list of the businesses of what they? If we do. have a list of businesses, you might understand what type of businesses you might encounter, what type of types of things that you're yeah. going to. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of thinking about it on the abstract. I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in your thing here, I don't, I don't see somebody that wanted to come in and teach music lessons would fall underneath your thing. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you set it up that, you, that a person can have a business where they can have more, no more than one client in their business or maximum number of clients in a business in a day, when we say we, we but, but that 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 would be that would be the term, and so all those other types of businesses would automatically fall into that. And there's your checklist. I'm only going to have seven people at, a, at a, during a day, no more than one person um, in my home doing whatever it is that I'm doing a business for. And then if the, the the issue about traffic and those types of things is really a non-issue because you're on a you're on a local street, which 
um, seven extra trips a day is not going to impact that street. And, and we want it to be too where, I mean, people have in their neighborhoods, you know, they have the right to have as, as many people over as they want whenever and where, right. you know, is it really going to be impactful if there's, if there is customer traffic or, you know, like what is it that makes, I think, you know, noise is a big thing. Um, probably signage where it, mm -hmm. it looks, doesn't look like a neighborhood anymore. Um, yeah. Things like that, but you can't. You can't. I'm selling you fireworks in my house. Probably not. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and that's that's where if we're looking at some example businesses and thinking about how how they would be performed from a home, you know, maybe we want to relax the zero customer traffic and say, you know, one client at a time or something along those or lines. Because that's I'm only going to have one person. There. Do I really need to have two off street parking spots? I mean. Your code that you just showed us here, the IBC code, says that as long as there are no employees, I only need to have one. So why do we require two? No, two parking spaces are required for every single family residence. Right, but I'm just saying, but you guys also, we also, as conditional uses, we require to have extra. We consider extra. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just saying the IBC code says that you only need to have one parking spot if, you're no, if you have no employees. Oh, you mean the the back page of the International Zoning Code. Yeah, the example of the International Zoning Code does have um, parking spaces required. That's, yeah. that's just, we put that in there as an example. No, that's what I mean, that, that was good. I like that, yeah. I like that. Well, I, <coughs> I would say that um, no matter what we do, it would have to be an improvement over the way it is now, frankly, because we get stuff that comes in front of the Board of Adjustments or Planning Commission, or whatever. And it's I mean, like uh, I've, uh, just in the six months I've been here, the four or five people have come before us, uh, the anxiety that they have to experience, <laughs> the, um, you know, somebody that wants to run tack or bake cupcakes or watch four kids or something. Right. And those, I, in some of those cases, I'm just like wondering, you know, why, 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 why are we why here? Why are making these people jump through all these hoops? You know? mm -hmm. I mean, we should be encouraging, hey, it's sales tax. Right. Because, yeah, and I mean, as long as they'd have a sales tax number, that would be that another requirement. Otherwise, somebody, I mean, somebody can bake as many cakes as they want every day in their house, right. you know, like it's as long as it's just not impacting, like in these businesses, like their neighbors wouldn't know they exist. I do like the mm -hmm. idea, though, of having to let to let them know, because say that so, say somebody's making crafts and there's like always like hammering noise. My mom, my mom, my mom makes on. quilts all the time. Yeah. And whether she's selling them online or having people instantly come up and pick them up. You know, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. One requires a conditional use permit, one does not. Right. And, and in the end, I think let's just make it simple. Yeah. Maybe we don't even need that in there. I, I like the, I, I think the idea of adding sales tax is another yeah. check off, checklist. I, I think that is a good, good checklist. Idea. But what if they don't do enough business to meet the sales tax license? At least you know they're, they're talking to people. Business. What do you mean? What's the, what is there? Is there a minimum threshold? I don't know. I, don't know. I think if, I, I think if we can collect two cents on a hundred dollar sale, you know, we'll take the two cents. So they must have it um, in order to do business. Is that? I mean, they must check that yes on the checklist. Or? I I would I would I would like to see a co I would a copy of their sales tax license would accompany the permit. I would say that if they're doing a business where they would actually be in contact with the city, that they probably would have a sales tax license. Otherwise, it, I mean, it probably would be a hobby. If you know, mm -hmm. or why would you? Well, I mean, it's. I'm just saying, if a person wants to do that, they get a sales tax license. Yeah. Not every, not everybody has to have a sales tax license for what they do. Certain services are not required to, to do that. They would still at that point. They would have a tax ID mm -hmm. that they report against as a provider. Some sort of documentation from a tax authority. Okay, yeah, I think that's good. That's a real good start. Great start. Okay, good job, Jill. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Um, all right, so yeah, we'll, we'll look into that and we'll look at other communities and then uh, we'll see what we can get you guys in the future. All right.
Agenda item six is the resolution number 2018-08 that was uh, postponed at our last meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I was the one that made the motion to postpone at the last meeting. Um, since that meeting, we've had two, two meetings of uh, a science, temporary sign code subcommittee, and we were going to have a meeting this morning or yesterday morning. But that was the resort as well. I'm sorry. So many, too many <laughs> meetings. Too many meetings. Um, anyway, um, we think that we are probably 85% there. We've expanded the concept of just temporary zones and the boulevard to a whole new look, uh, look at temporary s signs throughout the entire community. And we are planning on uh, one more meeting here in the next week or two. And because of that, um, then, then coming back with a rehashed proposed ordinance amendment. So, so because of that, I'd like to keep this, the thing moving. I would like to postpone this again for um, till til May tenth. Uh, is, is that a month? Well, we could go the May the following planning commission twenty fourth. Yes. Yeah. May twenty fourth. Okay. Because we may have to publish an amendment. Right. Yep. Before we close discussion on this, it looks like under C2, there's a typo. I think I, there's a lot. Uh, well, and I know, uh, yeah, there's maybe there's more than just one, but well, under to all applications for the placement, I think there's missing a T, and then I think it's probably of certain temporary signs. Yeah. I think ultimately that language is going to change Ultimately what you have in our packet, oh, okay. It looks, it will look nothing like that. Okay, right. understood. Never mind then. I didn't mean to be nitpicky. I just nope. hate to come back to a final meeting and then have like. No, we've, uh, right. we're in the process. I think uh, we've made a lot of headway. Um, we've just got one last heavy lift. Yeah, no. so, so this, this was coming from what is essentially an addendum to the existing ordinance to a, a major rewrite of our entire temporary sign ordinance. Correct. So um, I'll make that motion to postpone till the 24th of May. Second. Motion by Kay, second by Colhane. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll postpone it till May 24th. 24th, right? Is it through May 24th? Mm-hmm, yep. yeah. Yep, so we have three weeks in between this planning commission and then May 10th, and the next meeting, and then it won't be that, it'll be the following. So that'll give some time, and then we'll get a meeting together soon, and we've been making good progress with those, so. And we'll come back with a uh, consistent content neutral sign code. Excellent. Moving on to agenda item seven, which is a resolution for amending a zoning district in Willow Creek Village, second edition. Zone of all that portion of Outlot 6 lying north of 2nd Avenue South and west of 22nd Street East. I'll pull it up here on the map. It's the shaded area. Um, the petitioner is Donald Endress, the president of Willow Creek Development Inc. The petitioner submitted the application and petition on March 29th requesting approval of the rezoning um, currently described or it's currently zoned R3 which is multifamily residential district and they are proposing to rezone it to R1, single family residential residential district. Um, their, reasoning, uh, their reasoning for that um, is that they would like to develop the lots as single family housing and R1 um, is more restrictive than R3. So uh, a similar, also just for a little history, a similar request for, was approved in 2014 when the lots on the west side of the pond were rezoned from R3 to R1. Okay, well, I'll just stay on this right now. Um, it does meet all of the, um, the lots in that existing R3 zoning do meet the minimum lot area and width requirements. The rezone will extend to the center line of the adjacent public right of ways. And um, the only the only issue is that they're um, in this. Why did my stuff go? Sorry. 
Okay. So there will be no transition zoning from the C3 zoning district to the R1. Um, that was also done in 2014 when they rezoned these houses here, um, or these lots, and some of them have single family houses on them now. Um, yeah, I'll open for questions. It says now number six, the pond will remain zoned as R3. Does that mean that in theory you could fill it in and then put an apartment complex on it or what? Houseboat. Houseboat. And that's <laughs> <laughs> um, you just wait, there's one coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't I wonder if there's a deed restriction on that lot, and if there isn't, there really should be because it doesn't actually have access and it's it's their detention pond. Um it so just stuck out to me. I just, I didn't want to get bogged down too bad. I mean, they could turn it into they could put an island and have a moat. It, it would be an exceptional situation, I think, to do okay. that. <laughs> and then they'd have to take care of their um, stormwater detention requirement Something elsewhere. Out. Is that pond maintained by the city or by the landowner? By the landowner. Do you, do you, Brandy, Brandy, do you know the circumstances surrounding the uh, approval in 2014 of the R1 abutting to C3, which is not normal? I mean, what was the rationale at that time? And to be honest, I didn't, I looked at the resolution, um, but I, or in the minutes, I did not watch the video, um, but there was, there wasn't any discussion on it. From what I saw, I mean, I could have that could have been part of a video of when the meeting happened. Are the property owners of the proposed R one the same as the C three? Yes. That's to the north. Currently. Currently. Yeah, currently until if a, if a single family. Were and, and 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 they are aware that any uh, commercial property that butts up. A residential zone, they are restrictions. There's some separate. Are there extra separation distances there? Or do you have to? Do you have to have a bigger buffer? Too big fence. It's just going to be your regular setbacks. But I mean, we do have within the overlay district a bigger buffer, and it's got to be grass and green and everything else. Okay. Just between the separation between a commercial and residential between property. Okay. So I think there's an extra. There's protection. Twenty there foot buffer of green space that's going to be required between those two properties. Okay. But their setbacks are still going to be the controlling factor. Would they be required to put fencing or screening up off from those residential properties? Uh, within the commercial against the residential, it could be required. Okay. Uh, Mr. Case, my name is Joe Quinn. I represent Royal Creek Development. Um, from the uh, current R1 on that map that you see there, uh, moving west to the larger lot where we are currently building an apartment building, Thank you. you from from this point here, r r relatively from right here to approximately right there, we have taken that that buffer zone um, that Ken referred to, and we have, uh, according to the drainage uh, plan that we've put together with our civil engineering, we've created a berm structure there with trees and things like that. It's our intention to continue that all along this uh, this property until we get to the the um, the correct yes so to answer your question regarding the c3 abutting and r1 this this lot right here does that is technically correct and this lot would be as well um, but it's our intention to further enhance screening with trees and and uh, dirt work Multiple thank you screening. Good. any other questions from the board Public hearing? Yeah, we uh, have to open the public hearing. Either. Sorry, mm -hmm. let the record show that the public hearing is, is open. Is there anybody else that wants to speak on behalf or against? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any additional discussion from the board? Sounds like they got a, got a plan, so it's anything major. Any major objection? I think the existing land use plan shows this as kind of a, either a commercial or mixed use area, um, yeah. and I, I'm not sure where the new plan is going to have it, but um, 
I think their proposal to use natural buffers doesn't impact the the R1 and the C3 budding up. So I, I would I would make a motion to approve. I'd second. Motion by Mr. Kays, second by Mr. Stein. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Item eight on the agenda is a replat of block five of Valley View. All right, this agenda item um, is, and you guys actually have just, you've seen block five of Valley View first edition, not um, too far back where we rezoned it from R3 and R1 to all being R2, which is single family attached residential district. Um, let's go back here. So the petitioner is Jamie Andrews, um, the acting agent for Valley View First Edition. The I won't read all that, but yeah, fine. The petitioner submitted a reply to Block Five of Valley View First Edition on March 29th, requesting approval for subdividing the existing five lots in the plot of Valley View First Edition into nine conforming lots with R2 single-family attached residential district zoning. The proposed lots one through nine of Block Five. down here so you guys can see the reference. Okay. The proposed lots one through nine of block five were recently rezoned from R1 to and R3 to R2 as I stated um, so that the lots could be subdivided and developed as duplexes. The zoning ordinance amendment was approved by city council on April 2nd, 2018 and then it was of this board's request and we would have brought this forward anyway. There is not any public right of way being dedicated. They're doing a private road for access, but it does create over five new lots. Um, but then also as a condition of the rezone, um, the plan commission did request that the replat come forth. It, it would have anyway, but um, that all, all nine lots are that are create, being created are conforming and meet the minimum lot area and width requirements. And then as far as the private road, um, we did discuss this at a design review team meeting with city staff and different departments. Um, and the private road will provide frontage to lot five as well as lot eight, actually lot four through nine will have their frontage will be from that private road. Now, but they also do front a public right of way. So the only one that is landlocked by this replat is lot five. Um, which is the only lot being created that does not front a public right of way. An agreement for the private road will be filed with the plat. Lots four through nine are proposed to utilize the private road for frontage. Okay. And they'll adhere to the setbacks um, from the public right of ways. Setbacks are not required on private roads, although an easement must be unobstructed. And we do, we have requested um, sufficient easements and we have the approval of the Watertown Municipal Utilities. So then they are able to um, do their work um, within that private road. And then also going forward, we decided that usually we bring the development agreements just to city council and we only present a plat to the plan commission, but we thought it would be of your benefit to be able to review the development agreements that are subsequent to a plat and required so that you're having, I mean, as the planning commission and looking into these things that you're um, being, in, that you're involved and then if there's any concerns that you see, um, any additions that um, you would like to suggest to be made to it. A lot of the language is standard, um, but I mean, in this situation, the one, the part that is a little different is the private road section because, um, you know, usually we do have the public right of way dedication. And what's awkward about that language is that we, s we kind of go back and forth between road and street, but this is actually how it is written in ordinance. I, I didn't, I mean, cause it says private road and then A talks about street. So um, that, that's where, just to point that out, if that was confusing to anybody. Um, but then otherwise, all of the public right-of-way improvements, that'll be done 
by the well the same developer actually that's signing this that will sign this agreement because he's the landowner there too but for grant 16th fourth and grant on the south that'll all be improved by um, j and j land sales as well and they they signed into the development agreement for valley view first edition that came through last summer and then another agreement that is attached um, i guess the exhibits Exhibit A shows the cost estimate for what the developer will incur for this replot. And then um, Exhibit B is attached, although it is really small where you can't really read, but this shows that um, the buildings have to adhere to the elevations that are given for each lot, that which, um, what the lowest finished floor should be, and that's to protect people from building low and then being within the water table when um, cores were taken so they they know where it's at just to protect homeowners. Um, and then the agreement for the construction and maintenance of the private road and other miscellaneous plat conditions is also included and this just tell and this it's good that this is filed with the plat because it explains that um, you know uh, city services are usually not provided on private roads. So it just makes somebody that's looking into buying that lot aware that, that those provisions exist. Um, like your, your garbage pickup would be on 16th Avenue or Grant Drive. Um, and then uh, and your, and your mail, we put that's in here too. Um. So, so This, the houses are going to front the private drive, or the that's the intent. Yep. And the, there's no restrictions on parking on the 28 foot road because Not it's right. private. Mm -hmm. And is there street lighting going to be on that private road? No, not public. If they do it, if the private road is their project. And then, it's, how is the addressing work for the lot five? Um, we we talked about it um, just with some of the people within city staff that work on the addressing, and we proposed to the developer that they first they didn't have well they didn't have it labeled it just said the in ingress and egress easement is granted by this plat, so um, but how we've went up, went um, done this in the past is that we've had them call out what the private road will be called because for as far as um, emergency vehicles and you know pe trying to find these locations fifth street west is what made sense to us that they would be addressed off of fifth, fifth street west okay and we included that in here too um so then it wasn't like they th usually it, it leaves it up to the developer to name it but as far as um our EMS stuff. We, so I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. So we did have a fairly lengthy discussion, and we felt it was critical that two things happen. One, that we didn't have some obscure name for one little block, even though it's a private road. So, you know, finding Jones Avenue or Jones Street that's in a small segment like that, it's kind of difficult. So we thought consistency with Fifth Street to the north was important. And then also then carrying the addressing through there as if it was a public street would be a lot easier for those people to both address themselves and for the emergency services to find them when they need to. So that was uh, the culmination of our discussion. And, and yeah. where do they, so where is their garbage pickup then for five? Where do they take their cans? They can choose to either have it picked up off of 16th Avenue or Grant Avenue. Okay. Um, yeah, so developer agrees on their behalf and that of their successors and title interests of lots four through nine that the pickup point for residential solid waste and recycling and other similar services for lots four through nine shall be located adjacent to Grant Drive or 16th Avenue North. And yeah, I didn't know, Shane, if we actually ended up calling it out. That's why I wanted to read it, but like what Shane said. So, so sidewalks are required in the public right of ways, but will sidewalks be along the private drive? No, they're not required, but. You know, for it, 
it's the developer's discretion. Obviously, sidewalks are nice. They could put them in if they want them, essentially. Where it might help make their development more marketable. So I, I see on the plat there, I see the, the utility easement for those properties. Are the utilities going to be located underneath the private drive or along it? Um, I have the utility plan from, from municipal utilities, unless Mark wants to speak on it. He almost got up. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Meyer, Wiretown Utilities. Um, we're not going to put anything under north and south, but we do plan on crossing east and west. Okay. So sanitary sewer will go which way? North and south. South, okay. And another nice reason with the private road and not and having the access points on public right-of-ways is that a uh, garbage truck or snow removal equipment isn't going in there and breaking up their private road and then those people having the expectation that well the city did it so the city s should fix it so and it is at least you know it's not such a long distance but it and it does add a hassle but that's where they are they know that going into it when they buy the lot from the title you know they'll get this in their title work Brandy. So there is a covenant that's going to follow with that lot, those lots. Yeah, well, they'll they'll read it in this agreement that we have with the developer that um, then those discussions should be had where they'll be informed of it. Did the city attorney review the development agreement? Yes, Matt was, yeah. Okay, so what happens to their obligations with the previously recorded development agreement? To um, which this is this runs with the land, right? Um, I, I think as far as because of the public right of ways and whatnot, is that what like the improvements to those? Mm -hmm. I think those are still um, taken care of with the first edition, but then this would just be because you know they're only plotting within the the lot lines are within the right of way. So then, so this is an additional obligation. It doesn't nullify. There, it's it doesn't rescind that right. the Valley View it first It still edition. applies. Yeah. Yep, and we can verify that again with Matt just to make sure. But And that's kind of the nice thing, too, with how we're going to go about bringing these to plan commission so then we can get all these out before we would bring it to council and have mm -hmm. them. So we'll, we'll make mm -hmm. sure that we verify that nothing is being rescinded because we don't want that. Right. That's confusing, too. Well, I'm supportive of it because I, I'll see this every day I walk out my front door. And so I'm, I'm wanting to see new houses to stop the wind. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe catch some of that snow, huh? Oh, God. <laughs> we have the South Adult Bond. I live there for 14 years. I've never had uh, more than six inches of snow in my driveway. I have to repair drifts this winter. That last one was bad. Uh, Go up right here. No. I live on 81, and I had a three-foot drift in my driveway. <laughs> Do we have to make a motion to approve it, or what's the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you... Just make your motion. Is it just the one action? So we've got... Yeah. Um, it's still... We're only acting on the resolution 2018-13. Okay. Does that include the recommendation of the development agreement, or, or that's just more part of the information? Yeah, just, uh, just part of the agenda item. Just as, yeah, for your reference. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion by Colhane. Second. Second by Johnson. Any additional discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. So item nine is again uh, open public comment. If there's anybody that would like to speak in the public, nothing. Any new business? I believe we need to elect officers. We were going to include that on the May 10th. Okay. Um, I mean, it's you, it's your call unless you guys want to do it now. Well, he's doing a good job. So that's that's fine. We can put it on the agenda for the 10th. Okay. And then yeah, we'll, it'll be our item. It'll be on the top there. Um, 
I do have new business too. Um, and more so of a clarification, I know when we talked about Second Street and that vacation that you guys were wanting a heads up on things in the hopper. And um, we, do, we do have another request, it, but as far as how far do you want us to go with those? I mean, if it, it's not an improved right away that the next um, petition is for. Are you, are you talking about the recently vacated Second Street? What, what, are, you, what are you referring right. to? Right. Well, okay. Well, I just wanted clarification because I know what at you guys wanted more time to prepare to you know. So then you were able to. So if we brought it up as new business that we have this vacation in the hopper, and then you guys had time to um, ask staff questions and get the answers that you needed before you were um, first told of it at, at a public hearing. Now, do you want that to be just the policy going forward that we have with vacations, or I don't, I don't know how to, uh, I guess, differentiate between. So you're asking the question is when a future vacation comes up, when do when do we want to know about it? Yeah. Did not, I detect that there is a future one coming up? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it shouldn't be as contentious as the last one, but just with that petition, um, they met the deadline then for the May 10th meeting, and um, I mean, I, I don't know, I could, I could show you the request. If the, if I just didn't, I, I don't know. I don't want to add a lot to either, but I don't know how to differentiate <coughs> between it. Well, I'd just soon deal with what it comes up rather than having to, you know, Discuss it twice. Right. right. And so some of the things that we've talked about in the last time too were some of those bullet points. Uh, I know they're you know they're they're always addressed in the the write up, um, but I, I think some of it was just trying to make it a little bit more explicit that yes we've looked into the emergency services yes we've looked into these ancillary functions right. Yeah, and then we as staff, then we could have that, all of those questions answered that, and like what had Liam, Liam had proposed, and we can do it that way, so then we, everybody's more well-informed. Um, and then, I mean, you do get the agenda the week, well, mm -hmm. at least four days before the meeting. So then, um, if there are questions, then we'd be happy to provide any information. Um, and then... Uh, I mean, we'd already have the public hearing notice out, so um, the, the public's informed. So if we just go with that process that will, to meet state law requirements. I think it's a little bit different depending on the type of vacation. If it's somebody that I'm vacating an old part of an alley or I'm vacating a public right-of-way that's never been developed is one thing. Yeah. Vacating a street that's already got curb and gutter and it's being utilized and those types of things, I I'll leave it at your call you know, how you guys want to approach, but I think Sounds it's, it depends, I mean, there's different levels of vacation. Yeah. And, and we always discuss at, we have a staff meeting where it can be a group effort to decide if this is something that will, that needs a little more. I mean, and that's what we did with Second Street too, and we did send out, you don't need to send out um, mailings to adjacent landowners, but to keep them informed, we did. Um, and then so things like that we can just discuss as staff and then if it's something where we want to give you guys a heads up, um, we can bring it up as new business. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's always that fine line of like when it's public information and it's not too. Yeah, absolutely. So, but if there's a public notice out, then public. Did we answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that works. Um, and I don't have anything else for new business or old business. No other old business? No need for executive session? Motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Stein? Second. Second by Colhane. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're done. Thank you all.